we want to delve into a little bit of the glory of God and his power. And he is so magnificent and so mighty, it's incomprehensible to understand him completely. But we want to give him some glory if possible. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. And the earth was invisible and unfurnished. And there was darkness over this abyss. And a breath of God went forth above the water. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God made a separation between the light and the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was an evening and there was a morning, the first day. The fourth day, then God said, let there be luminaries in the firmament of heaven to give light on the earth, to make a separation between the day and the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Let them be for illumination in the firmament of heaven so as to shine on the earth. And it was so. God indeed made two great luminaries, the greater for the regulation of the day and the lesser luminary with the stars for the regulation of the night. And God placed them in the firmament of heaven so as to shine, to shine on the earth and to regulate the day and the night and to make a division between the light and the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was an evening and there was a morning, the fourth day. This translation is taken from the Septuagint which I feel is more poetic and meaningful than our normal translations. Here we have the layout that God formed for man. Nothing was left out. Everything had meaning. When we study the sun, moon, and the stars, we must be very careful. Many have become so repulsed by astrology that it seems better to ignore the heavens altogether than to risk being associated with that gross error. In the early 1900s, when the sun went down, the stars came out in all their glory. Nowadays, with electricity and street lights and an array of entertainment options have greatly diminished the stars' impact on our daily lives. I remember when I was a small boy in the summer, my family used to lay out on a pallet in the yard at night and appreciate the wonders of the stars. And in fact, back in 1994, in Los Angeles, California, during a blackout, the 9-11 operators were flooded with calls from frantic citizens, baffled by the cloud of light in the sky. Little did they know they were seeing the beauty of the Milky Way for the first time. The scriptures are filled with the reference to the stars and the concordance, the form of the word star is used over 105 times. In some cases, it is a reference to the spiritual and not the physical. It has long been suggested that the constellations are God-given illustrations of gospel truths. Indeed, constellation names go far back into mankind's history. The Jewish historian Josephus says they were named by Seth, the third son of Adam. But perhaps even Adam had a part since he named the animal world, Genesis 2.19. The Bible says that God assigns his own name to the stars. Psalms 147, verse 4. If so, he may have revealed them to early people. The idea of seeing the gospel message in the stars was popularized 
by the study of E.W. Bullinger and J.A. Sice in the early 1800s. Early writings on this subject went into great detail regarding different parts of the constellations so that practically every star was assigned a special meaning as to how it was applied to scripture. The gospel message may well have been purposely written in the skies by the Lord. In that case, perhaps the star signs serve as a memory aid before scripture was available. Today, of course, the Bible provides a clear message about the plan of God. Although the stars continue to declare the glory of God, Psalms 19.1, and are useful in our calendar system, Genesis 1.14. The Bible does not tell us to search the stars for detailed messages. On the contrary, the warnings are given against trusting in the stars in this regard. Caution is needed when searching for the gospel in the stars, since constellation symbols can have many interpretations. Since Babylonian times, Satan has counterfeited the zodiac with astrology. Many people still claim to see symbols of the gospel in unusual places, crosses on flower petals, and so forth. Christmas stars on sand dollars, even religious images on rusty water towers. Our Heavenly Father certainly designed all things, but we must be aware of building our doctrine on the details of nature. We can be thankful that the Bible presents the gospel to us clearly, that we have no need for additional evidences of truth. Early on in the scriptures, we read of the great significance God applied to the stars, even to relate their number to Abraham's future seed, Genesis 15 and 5. And we quote, and he, God, took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. This comment had a companion scripture, which is found in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, 41, and has a dual application. We quote, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. In God's perfection, all that he has created is glorious, the heavenly bodies as well as his creation of the saints. Each of the heavenly bodies are different. Each serve a specific purpose as well as the call, the saints. Each differ one from another in their service to the heavenly father. Nothing in the father's plan is done without great reason. And this applies to all he has created. Another account of the stars is found in the book of Matthew in chapter two. We'll start with verse seven. All of these scriptures are to show how and where the wise men were to locate this king of the Jews. Verse 7. Then Herod secretly called the Magi. Now this was the sect of the wise men from the east who, who had supposedly been founded earlier by the prophet Daniel. And discerned from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I may come and worship him. Herod was terrified that another king would supplant his authority. And having heard the king, they went their way, the Magi. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. 
And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. These men, the Magi, were not only well-trained in the scriptures, but they were also astronomers of the highest order. They knew what to look for in finding the child as well as being directed by God. We now turn your attention to the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. In this chapter, the prophet is attempting to show us the greatness of God. In speaking concern for his people, we start with verse 1. Let me quote, Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, and that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and every hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And brethren, that is what we truly, truly pray for every night when we say our prayers. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth as it is done in heaven. In this quotation, we see the beautiful beginnings of the kingdom period, continuing in the 22nd verse. It is he who sits above the vault of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Verse 25. To whom then will you liken me that I should be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength. Not one of them is missing. Reminds you of the story of the 99 and one brethren. Not one of them is missing. And we would like to add that it is with the saints. There's not one less or one more to make up the number of 144,000. Our Heavenly Father clearly made the stars as we have seen. But what about the constellations? As soon as we mention talking about them, it must be astrology, right? wrong. God himself uses the Maseroth, the Hebrew word for the 12 sign constellations, as an example of his power. In fact, he is the one who brings them out and guides them. If you doubt the importance of the constellations, look at the huge effort Satan has put into counterfeiting God's original message to mask them from us. Sadly, he has been so successful now that most Christians refuse to look at the stars for fear of being associated with astrology. The thought is that Job goes back to the time of Abraham, which would be thousands of years ago. Considering this statement from Job in 3831, first a statement from the present day astronomers, they have confirmed that Pleiades is gravitational bound, while Orion is unstable. This is quite interesting, brethren. The comment to Job from God in 3831, he says, Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? In other words, the chains mentioned in this statement by God represent the gravitational control over the planet, the Pleiades, while the loosening represents the lack of similar control over Orion. 
continuing in the 32nd verse of Job. And this is Jehovah speaking. The Maseroth as he guides them. The bear mentioned here is basically the Big Dipper, Ursa Major. Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you establish the rule on the earth? God goes on telling Job. He controls all of nature as well as the heavenly. Finally, God says to Job, will the fault finder contend with the almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to thee? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken, and I will not answer, even twice, and I will add no more. So here we have a firsthand account from God himself on his earthly as also his heavenly creation. And so it is. In the book of Amos, we find a famous statement by the prophet of God as it relates to the constellations. A little background on Amos before we cite his comment. Amos was a shepherd from a rural area in Judah whom God called to preach at Israel's royal sanctuary at Bethel. His prophesying took place in about 750 BC during the reign of Jeroboam II, and it lasted only a few days. He revealed to Israel the great divide between the rich and the poor and the injustices that were occurring at the time. Our quotation comes from Amos 5 and 8 and is obviously a revealment to him from God. We quote, He who made the Pleiades and Orion and changes deep darkness into morning who also darkens day into night, who call for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the Lord. At the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name, unquote. There's an interesting note on the Pleiades at this point in our thought. Centuries back, up until the 1800s, people could only see six of the stars in the Pleiades cluster until the advent of more powerful telescopes. When this happened, the seven were clearly revealed. However, if people had only read their Bibles, they would have found this statement written thousands of years ago by Amos, chapter five, verse eight, King James translation, and we quote the entire verse, seek him, that maketh the seven stars of Orion and turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark with night that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Why do we quote these obscure passages? Because we're directing you to the power of God that is applied for man. In the 11th chapter of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul explains that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. He goes on, for by it, men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Not only has God given us the printed word for our edification, he has also revealed his knowledge about himself for our eternal reminder of his majesty in the stars. Paul finishes his thought in Hebrews 11 with these words. And all these speaking of the ancient worthies, including Amos, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us 
so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. First and foremost, we are Christians, not astronomers. Our study of the stars is really a study of him who made the stars. We should not glorify a sign or the constellations. We should glorify the Father and the Son. We must place our faith not in the sign or in heaven, but in him who made the heavens. We're told early on of this by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, not to worship the heavens. And said in quoting, and beware lest you lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and serve them those which the Lord your God has allocated to all the peoples under the whole heaven, Deuteronomy 4.19. The prophet also tells us the same caution, Amos 5.8. Seek him that maketh the seven stars, that is the Pleiades and Orion and other stars. In the Psalms, David speaks so eloquently concerning the creation of God. David tells us the message of God is revealing to us from his heavenly creation. A message of hope and assurance that all will come together and be made right. The sentiments of these words are extremely heartfelt, which show us the heart condition and the close communion David had with God. He says the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pour forth speech and night to night reveal knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them, he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chambers. Psalms 19, one through five. We have these words written for us in scripture, but for 2,500 years prior, the intent of God was to portray in the heavens with the signs that he established. Man has always desired to possess this divine message, which was spelled out in the stars. If we go back in time to the time of the Tower of Babel, right after the flood, we get a good picture of how mankind was desirous of holding on to the knowledge once possessed by the ancients. Ancient traditions, ancient traditions that are attributed to Josephus, the Jewish historian suggests that those around that time of the building of this tower of Babel was really a, represent, a representation rather of man building this tower as an observation point to view the stars. This biblical evidence carries us back at once, right back to the flood or about 2,500 years BC. This tower or temple or both was also called the seven spheres, according to some, and the seven lights, according to others. It is thus clear that the popular idea of its height and purpose must be abandoned, and its astronomical reverence to revelation must be admitted. The tower was an attempt to preserve and hand down the antediluvian traditions. Their sin was in keeping together instead of scattering themselves over the earth as was commanded. In reprint 1612, Brother Russell makes a very interesting statement of which we quote. He said, it is true that the sun and stars were caused to give light to the earth and were intended to do so. But there is nothing to indicate that they could not lighten other planets, or that this in this they entirely fulfill the end of their creation. It is true also that the sun does 
rule the day and the moon the night and that they are set as to mark times and seasons. But there's no limitation that this is the limit of their usefulness. Only that which specifically pertains to man and to the earth, his own, is mentioned. God was not attempting to teach astronomy. He was, we believe, leaving such things for mankind to investigate. The fields of science, art, discovery, and inventions are all open for man's pleasure and profitable exploration and will do and report, reward the patient and persistent exercise of his powers as God intended, unquote. We fully believe that in many cases, the references to stars is intended to reflect the spiritual and not the visible heavens above. Nevertheless, the heavens do serve the purpose of God's plans in the revealment of his son, prior to the written word, <coughs> pardon me, their instruction is to give glory to the Father and the Son for all to see on earth. In the firmament, there are 12 pictures or signs, if you will, that represent different figures. The figures themselves are perfectly arbitrary. There's nothing in the group of stars to even suggest the figures. This is the first thing which is noticed by everyone who looks at the constellations. For example, the sign of Virgo and look at the stars. There's nothing whatever to suggest a human form. Still less is there anything to show whether that form is a man or a woman. And so with all the others, as stated before, there is a major difference, the star references concerning Jesus and the heavenly bodies we are discussing in the heavens. The foregoing is a spiritual application and the other is material. Another point possibly of conjuncture is that constellations could reflect the earthly purpose of God intended for man on the earth. Take, for example, the signs in the heavens, the Maseroth, could possibly be identified with the 12 sons of Jacob. Joseph in the scriptures sees the sun and moon and 11 stars bowing down to him, he being the 12th, Genesis 37, 9. The blessings of Jacob, Genesis 49, and the blessings of Moses, Deuteronomy 33. Both bear witness to the existence of these signs in their day. And it is probable that each of the 12 tribes bore one of them on its standard. And we read in Numbers 2 and 2, every man of the children of Israel shall pitch by his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. This standard was the deagle, which the sign was depicted. Hence, it was called the ensign. Ancient Jewish authorities declare that each tribe had one of these as their own. And it is highly probable, even from scripture, that four of the tribes carried its sign and that four were placed at the four corners of the camp. For example, on the east side of the camp, we find the tribe of Ishakar representing cancer, Judah representing the lion and Zebulun representing Virgo. The tribe of Levi being in the center of the camp would represent Libra, the scales. These pictures were designed to preserve, expound and perpetuate the one first great promise in prophecy of Genesis 3.15, that all hope for man, all hope for creation was bound up in a coming redeemer one who should be born of a woman who should first suffer and afterwards gloriously triumph, one who should first be wounded by the great enemy who was the cause of all sin and sorrow and death, but who should finally crush the head of that old serpent, the devil. And so it is that the beginning with Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, 
Eris Tars the Bull, which is to say the Messiah coming to rule. Gemini Cancer and finally Leo, representing the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Maseroth speaks to us. As we have seen, the adversary has counterfeited this beautiful represented representation and turned it into what we recognize as astrology. Everything God has made, the adversary has counterfeited or polluted. 2,500 years ago, the prophets read the prophecy in the stars. Hence, we see the progression of God's plan in the stars, beginning with Virgo, interpreted as the virgin, all the way through the other 11, ending with Leo the lion, representing our Lord's overcoming and reward. Today, we have the sure word of God in the written word of the Bible. Mankind was never left without a witness of the future blessings to come. This truth is revealed through Peter in Acts 3, 20 and 21. He shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. These words have a new meaning for us. If we see the things which were spoken since the world began, thus written in the heavens, which utter speech, that is prophecy, and show forth this knowledge day after day and night after night, the heritage of the earth and their words reaching unto the ends of the world. And he carried me away into the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal jasper clear. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels, and the names were written on them which are the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine upon it. For the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. All will have been fulfilled in heaven and on earth, and so shall it be. Amen.